Hey guys, I'm here today with John Mullen. He works with an investment bank in China, runs a fintech community, and writes for a lot of fintech, fintech blogs talking about cryptocurrencies and emerging financial technology products. So what I want to get out of this interview today is just talk to him about the cryptocurrencies, what other stuff is going on in the fintech space, and just really start to get an understanding of cryptos for myself from a layman's point of view, because this is... What I found, I'm sure most of you guys have had similar experiences. Is a lot of the Bitcoin people talking about Bitcoin either go too technical or they don't really know what they're talking about in enough depth to trust cryptocurrency. So, super excited for this interview. On that note, John, my man, how are you? How are you, man? I'm doing good, thanks. And, uh, you know, I really appreciate the time and opportunity to come and uh, share some ideas about what's happening in the crypto and fintech space. Um, as you mentioned, you know, I'm based in Shanghai and uh, China is one of the leading fintech and crypto or until recently crypto uh, hotspots in the world, um, which I can delve into a little bit more later because uh, as you'll find out, the space moves very fast and, um, you know, regulations are just right behind. And uh, recently there's been kind of a, a blow up in, in within China in the crypto space. So, you know, happy to share some more thoughts about that later. Let's start with the beginning of why is it that you're so knowledgeable about the space? So what is your background exactly? Can you tell for the audience? Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, I don't want to come off and try to say that I'm like the super, no, like, you know, I don't know everything about cryptos. You know, I don't think anyone does. And if someone really does say that, they do. Um, unless they're, you know, one of the, unless they're Satoshi Nakamoto who founded Bitcoin or Vitalik Buterin who founded Ethereum. Um, I think they're kind of lying, <laughs> to be completely honest. There's just so much to lo- learn. So many new coins out there. Um, so anyway, my background is um, I am a fintech researcher at Guotai Junan Securities. Guotai Junan is one of the largest Chinese investment banks, and I focus not only on cryptos, but basically all things fintech. Um, so that would be blockchain, cryptos, payments, lending, artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, insure tech, reg tech, pretty much the intersection of finance, financial services and technology. And okay. um, I guess what kind of makes me have you know, this um, interest or passion or, or uh, expertise per se um, in this space is that, you know, I do this 24 seven for my, for my, for my daytime job. You know, I look at all of this stuff constantly um, and I've been doing this for a while um, and, you know, I just love it. So, you know, I'm always, uh, you know, I'm, I'm leading FinTech groups in China, I'm, uh, you know, speaking on lots of conferences about it. So I'm always talking with like-minded individuals about the space and, uh, you know, I think that kind of has helped me develop, uh, you know, a decent understanding of what's going on. Okay, so let's start at the top. What is a cryptocurrency and why is it important? Sure. Okay, so this can be a little bit confusing for a lot of people because um, by, by direct definition, a cryptocurrency would be a digital asset that is decentralized in nature, meaning there's not one single entity controlling it. So, for example, you, you take the USD, US dollar. Um, that would be a centralized currency because it's run and uh, basically printed and monitored and taken control of by one entity, which would be the Federal Reserve in the United States. A cryptocurrency uh, um, is basically it's basically run on a blockchain. The blockchain is a um, distributed ledger, meaning there's many different parties that verify the accounting ledger. So basically transactions happen on the ledger. And instead of one party, which would be, for example, the Fed or central bank, you have various miners who can verify the transactions happen and they get incentivized um, to solve these transactions by basically using supercomputing power um, to solve these complex algorithms, which then they're then paid for. So that's basically how how they are incentivized. If they fail to uh, properly verify the transaction, they don't get paid. So um, that's basically, you know, what it is on a very, 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 very low level. But then, you know, why is this important? I think there's several reasons. Um, one is the anonymous factor. So uh, basically, you send and receive money via an address, not via your own personal details. So like a block address, blockchain address, um, or, or, or cryptocurrency wallet. Um, and basically, this allows for a lot of, non, in, 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 excuse me, the word, anonymity. <laughs> I can't say it very properly. Um, <laughs> in uh, in transactions so you know a lot of people obviously do not want to necessarily see the government you know reaching in and, and seeing everything that they do you know they want some privacy in their lives it's like like most human beings would so this anonymous aspect allows allows for something of course you on the other hand you can say you know this can allow for a lot of illegal activity to happen and yes there is that aspect of it um, but i like to say that you know if you look at the internet 
Um, there's a lot of bad things happening on the internet, but you don't see anyone shutting it down anymore, right? Um, you know, half of the Fortune 500 companies are internet based companies. Um, anyway, so, you know, going back to the what is a cryptocurrency, um, basically, it's a, like I said, a digital asset that decentralized. Now you have all of these different cryptocurrencies coming out. You have, you know, you have your big ones, Ethereum, Litecoin, Ripple, something like this, but there's a lot of others. I think, you know, I, I think if you look at a website called Coin Market Cap, which is one that I always check out to see market caps of the different coins, you know, there's more coming online every day. Um, anything that's not a Bitcoin is called is considered to be an alt coin, an alternate coin. So Bitcoin was the first. It came out from a paper by Satoshi Nakamoto. Um, it was actually a very, um, I guess, uh, mysterious figure because no one exactly knows who he is or she is or it is. Um, they basically just authored this white paper about what Bitcoin can be. And uh, since then, it's kind of been taken over. It's open source. Um, anyone can access it. You can still access the white paper. And it's kind of changed the world. I mean, um, you know, cryptocurrencies are all the rage right now. They offer a lot of different aspects and, and, and characteristics. And I think I can go into a little bit more specifics later on. Because to be honest, each one is a little bit different. So for example, Bitcoin is different than Ethereum. Ethereum is different than something like a Ripple. They all have different purposes. So some of them are used for payments, you know, can be used for payments. Um, some of them uh, are used for remittance across the, across, across the ocean at, uh, at, at speed. Um, you know, Ethereum, you can program smart contracts into the code. Smart contracts meaning um, they're basically verifiable contracts um, that, that happen instantaneously when, when the uh, incentives are met or the uh, objectives of the contract are met. So, you know, there's a lot of interesting aspects of, of, of these kind of uh, cryptocurrencies that we can we can delve into on this on this talk. Awesome. Okay, so that's interesting stuff. A lot. Comes, <laughs> yeah, a lot to process there. What do people need to be aware of when they deal with cryptocurrencies? You said there is so many of them. There seems to be a lot of hype around, like you said, Bitcoin. Is there, from my understanding, generally when there's hype, there's it's not probably the best thing to go into. Is that true of Bitcoin or is it something that everyone should be investing in? What do we need to know about Bitcoin itself? Sure. Is... So, sure. So I think, you know, um, you know, I don't think necessarily everyone should invest in Bitcoin. You know, I don't think everyone's even invested in, you know, traditional uh, financial products. Um, <laughs> so, you know, you, you definitely want to make sure that when you're getting into something that can be, you know, relatively volatile and is definitely a new kind of financial asset out there, relatively new at least, in, in the big scheme of things, you got to make sure you're doing your homework. You know, I will always tell people, you know, start small, um, do your homework, you know, read up on what these what these cryptocurrencies are all about, what the platform is, what is it, what is it used for, um, <clears throat> what is the, you know, what's the potential volatility there, you know, what's the trends looking like. And then also, you know, if you want to start trading, um, I mean, I would say this for any any asset, but, you know, you better be prepared that any money that you invest, you are OK with losing. Um, you know, cryptos are, are naturally very, very volatile recently. They've gone they've gone, um, I guess, a little bit less as there's become more liquidity in the market. Um, but, you know, there's still there's still a very uh, high volatility compared to, you know, traditional financial assets. And I think that's actually what's a draw what's drawing people towards it, because, you know, you're seeing Bitcoin that's going up know 400 percent in a year or something like this i think in the beginning of the year it was at around a thousand now it's over you know over four thousand four hundred right now i'm just checking looking at the, at the total market cap um so i mean you know these kind of returns are, are obviously enticing for people um you can't you can't you know you can't can't deny that there's some potential there but you know, i would say you know the first thing is you know start small I usually tell people if you're, you know, already traditionally investing in, you know, equities and bonds and, and whatever, uh, maybe maybe put five to ten of five to ten percent of your portfolio in crypto. You know, start small, watch it, you know, watch it how it develops, um, and then you can always move and get a little bit more and more as you understand the space a little bit better. I mean, like you said, there's so many coins, um, so you know, from a from an outsider's perspective, it can be a little bit daunting. Um, so I would say, you know, start small and start at the top of the of the ranking table. So start with the bigger players. You know, most of these coins anyway, you have to either buy from um, buy through having Bitcoin or Ethereum, which are the two biggest. So, you know, start small, buy some Bitcoin, buy some Ethereum, 
and see how you can, you know, maybe di- maybe diversify a little bit, build up a little bit of more of a portfolio, maybe invest smaller amounts in, in smaller coins that you think are cool projects. Um, and then, you know, once you generate the interest, you can, you know, continue um, getting more in depth and putting more money in, etc. So you just it, it's, it's kind of like a learning process. And it's so new. Honestly, it's very, very new. You know, it's been around for eight years, but like mainstream adoption or people starting to talk about it all the time is very, very new. I mean, that's it became mainstream this year, in my opinion. Awesome. So what I mean, what I guess I'm hearing there is it's anything new. You should approach with caution, invest a small amount of your total portfolio. But what if if you're not investing in other stuff, would you should you be looking at Bitcoin or should you be doing more traditional stuff before you get into Bitcoin? Um, no, I think that, I think it's definitely possible to do, you know, you don't necessarily have to go straight into, you know, traditional financial uh, investments to then, then, then into Bitcoin. I don't think, I don't think those are, you know, that the, doesn't necessarily have to be the steps that you take. I, I've seen a lot of people who, who have nothing to do with traditional markets and they just tended to, um, maybe they played video games and, and this was something that they came across on the internet and then they kind of got into cryptocurrencies and they've been in it for a while and made a decent amount of money. Um, and actually understand, you know, how to read trend lines on on on, um, on trading, and you know how to how to read candlestick charts and things like this. And they know just as well as any other day trader would know if it was an equity or a stock or whatever. Um, so I don't necessarily think it's you, you have to go first into traditional investments before you go into Bitcoin. But again, you still have to be prepared to lose your money. Just in, you know, always have that mindset. Um, okay, I think so, something that's very important. Guess go what, ahead, I'm, go ahead. what I'm hearing there it seems to be a recurring theme with this whole conversation. Be prepared to lose what you put in, and be do your research. Definitely. I mean, I would also say that for anyone, though, not just for cryptocurrencies. To be honest, I just think you have to be more focused um, if you're going to be in this space. I mean. You know, in traditional financial markets, it's very hard to beat and to, to get better returns in the market, um, market average. So that's why there's been this flood of, of, of investment into passively traded funds, right? Um, mm-hmm. So I always tell people, you know, you can't you can't out you can't outperform the professionals over time, and we already have a hard, hard enough time performing. <laughs> So how do you expect to do that, you know, uh, on a space that's moving five times faster and, you know, is maybe, I don't know exactly the multiple, but several times more volatile. So, you know, just it's it's, it's important to go in with, you know, manage your expectations. And I think it's, it's very important with investing because <laughs> it lets it, it, it really um, the wild swings can go, make your mind go crazy. But, you know, for me, I'm a long term holder because I tend to be a value investor at heart. And, you know, I just see dips as opportunities to buy in at a better price. But a lot of people see that as a sell, and then they'll sell and lose money. So, cool. So it's I'm about s- it's about the mental aspect, I think. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, that's cool. So I'm hearing basically stick to principles and know your markets. Just the core kind of stuff that goes across to like any kind of investing. Investing full stop. Yeah, sure. I mean, there's obviously wrinkles that are very specific to cryptocurrencies, and you you'll figure those out once you kind of get your hands dirty a little bit and start playing around. Um, but you know, there's definitely, there's definitely similarities, definitely similarities. If people do want to get into cryptos, where should they start learning? Good question. So, um, you know, there's a lot of different good cryptocurrency web pages and publications that come out with news and articles and things like this. Um, so I would start, you know, if you want to get into kind of more of the, I guess, day-to-day updates about the space, you know, you might want to go to a website like um, Cointelegraph, who I write for. Another big one would be Coindesk. Coindesk does a lot of good stuff. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of cryptocurrency publications like that. You have to go to CoinMarketCap, which is like uh, one that has all the cryptocurrencies up to date, and you can see all their, their prices and their price changes and historical information. So that's a good one. Obviously, you need to get a crypto wallet. So you need to start with a wallet first. I would, I, I personally have a Coinbase and a blockchain, um, and then I trade on Bittrex and Bitfinex, which are two different uh, uh, trading platforms. So you can have multiple trading platforms, multiple wallets to hold your cryptos in. So you know, I, I think that's a good place to start. You know, getting some knowledge. Um, additionally, you if you want to get more wallets? into, is I'm assuming wallets, wallets? similar to having a bank. 
Um, kind. I mean, thing is, there's basically zero fees to. Uh, I mean, you don't have to pay to set up a wallet, and mm-hmm. it's kind of good to have somewhat of your assets. In my opinion, you uh, to have them somewhat spread. I mean, there's it's known to have uh, that there's there's the possibility of uh, wallets and exchanges being hacked. So you mm-hmm. know, if you have all your money on one place and it gets hacked, then uh, sorry, you're SOL. <laughs> um, <laughs> to, I mean, to be honest, I had a friend. I had a friend who lost a lot of his lot of his um, uh, portfolio because it got hacked. It was um, like I guess I think he lost like several several thousand dollars. Um, which isn't like a ton in the big scheme of things, but you know, I've heard of, I've heard of people losing way more than that too. So kind of crazy. Okay. So that's a pretty scary thought for people to realize that it's not, so it's not entirely secure, but everyone's touting it as being a secure technology. Why, how does Bitcoin get hacked? Okay. So the good question, um, you don't actually hack Bitcoin, you like the weak point would be the exchange, which isn't necessarily done on the blockchain. The blockchain technology itself is very, very, very hard to um, like hack because uh, they use a cryptographic technology that's very difficult to solve and, and not really time efficient or effective for, for hackers. However, you know, you have to store these assets someplace, right? Um, let's say you store them in uh, in a wallet and someone decides to target that wallet or that wallet provider and they breach the wallet website somehow. You know, mm-hmm. that's that's not necessarily hacking blockchain, that's hacking like a website or hacking the company's servers. Um, not necessarily hacking the technology itself, if that makes sense. So the blockchain technology, which is running all of these cryptos on, or which is where all the cryptos are run on, uh, that itself is really actually quite secure. Um, but there's weak points, you know, if you have different platforms that it's being run uh, through, if that makes any sense. Okay, I'm hearing, for what I'm understanding, it's the equivalent, digital equivalent of a bank. That's what a wallet is. It's placed Similar, to yeah, your Bitcoin. I, I consider it more like a vault. Okay. Because we don't, well, they're, they're, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so that's the place where you... Safe spot to put, your, put, to put your cryptos, yep. Except it's not entirely safe because there are vulnerabilities to it. Could be. Could be. Okay. That's why you go with the big. That's why you go. That's why you go with the big providers. But at the same time, you know, you also have. If you look at it from the other side, you have something like Equifax, um, who just lost 160 million people's <laughs> data, and that's a traditional <laughs> financial uh, entity. So hmm. you know, safety is all relative, I suppose. <laughs> yes, so. can be hacked in the world. You know, <laughs> um, it's just there's certain things that are safer than others, and I think you know that's why you try to go with these more well-known. Um, providers of, 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 of wallets or, or exchanges because they have a lot higher security uh, measures. So what do they get out of it? The wallet providers? Correct. Okay, so for example, let's say I have a blockchain wallet. Um, it's literally called blockchain.info. Um, and they can store uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum on it. So if I want to send Bitcoin or Ethereum to someone, to something... To pay for something to um, to send it to my you know trading account, I have to pay a very small fee. Okay, so someone's so still making money on the tr- the transaction then. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But in, it's like insignificant compared to what you'd be doing for um, like a um, bank transaction, for example. So say say I wanted to send. I'm from the U.S. I'm living in China now. So I wanted to send $10,000 to my parents in the U.S. or to an account in the U.S. If I would do that in, you know, through a traditional bank, you know, they'd charge me exchange rate, plus they'd charge me, I don't know, $50, $50 at least to make that transaction happen, and it could take three days. I could do that same thing with my blockchain account, uh, and it would take maybe an hour if I was slow, and it would uh, cost me... 25 cents. How do they do the transaction then? Um, how does blockchain do the transaction? How does so they the basically wallet just... Wallet guys, how do they, how do the wallet guys facilitate that for you? From my understanding, I mean, they just basically set up the transaction and send it from one account to the other. And then the miners verify it. And once the transaction has been verified, then it goes through the system and everything automatically updates. What's to stop somebody like somebody from down the road just saying, "I've got a wallet now, 
come bank, come set up your Bitcoin with me? I mean, you could. I don't think there's. I don't think there's a whole lot of stickiness with uh, wallets, to be completely honest. Which is why I have several, and most people have several. Um, and also, certain wallets only hold certain coins. So, for example, my um, my uh, blockchain wallet only holds Bitcoin and Ethereum. And I use those Bitcoin and Ethereum to then send to my trading account, which then I can buy all those different pairs through blockchain or through through Bitcoin, excuse me. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, you know, if I wanted to send my money to another place, I could. But it's not like they're really it's not a, it's not like um, it's not like someone's offering better rates than someone else. So it's a lot about, you know, are they a secure entity? Do you trust these guys? And I do trust uh, blockchain at info. And I know the founder. So it uh, okay. helps if you do, <laughs> you know, it, it, that's part of it. You, know, you want to go with one of the big players. And for me, this one's good enough. And um, it's easy access. I like the platform. I have it on my phone, too. I mean, I can have other ones, but I don't think it's going to necessarily hurt them in the long run anyway. They basically are just trying to help, um, you know, spread this technology. Uh, of course, it's a business, but. They want to. They're one of the biggest blo- wallet providers in the world, and I think you know their mission is to really help bring about you know this this kind of spread of, of, of financial inclusion through through cryptocurrencies. So these guys, the future J.P. Morgans of the world, in a sense. No, I don't think so. Okay. Um, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't necessarily think they're going to take over from J.P. Morgan, for example. Oh. There's too much other stuff that J.P. Morgan does. Yeah. These guys just store Bitcoin. Okay. Sounds cool. I think we've got cryptos covered to at least a starting point. So set up sure, with Coinbase, sure. set up, do your research, go, into, go to the websites you just mentioned. What were those sites again? Um, Cointelegraph.com. Um, you can do Coindesk.com and then also CoinMarketCap are three of the ones that I'm on constantly every day because um, they have a lot of info. CoinMarketCap okay. basically just measures all the, all the market caps of all the different coins. The price, price uh, movements and whatnot, and then CoinDesk and Coin Telegraph are more for um, news and 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 uh, information about uh, new projects, things that are happening in the space, etc. Awesome. Now, if someone wanted to, what else are you excited about in the fintech space at the moment? And what's really got you pumped up and excited? Yeah, sure. Um, so I would say, to be completely honest, you know, not just the cryptos themselves, but the actual blockchain technology, I think, is very, very cool. So, um, you know, I, people tend to focus on the cryptos because it's the most accessible part of the blockchain. But blockchain technology is, you know, it can be used on a variety across a variety of different industries. Um, you can use it in the healthcare system. You can use it to, you know, to track patients' information. You can use it in uh, real estate. Um, you know, you can use it in art dealing, you can use it in, you know, pretty much everything. There's so many interesting ways that are coming out. And I think, um, you know, you see all these new projects that are doing ICOs, initial coin offerings to raise money on blockchain. Um, and a lot of them are really, really cool. A lot of them are also like kind of, uh, illegitimate and probably only trying to make some money off of the ICO. But, um, you know, for me, blockchain is super interesting. I think there's so many interesting things that are happening on it. And, um, I think for me, that's really cool. Another thing that I'm looking at in, in the fintech space in general. Um, <clears throat> so I work for a financial institution, obviously. And I think the you know machine learning capabilities of, of um, you know, a lot of these investment firms or lack thereof, I guess, right now, you know, they're still trying to build them up. Could be really interesting to see how you can really understand and quantify vast amounts of data. Um, so taking big data and then using machine learning applications to really understand what this information means and that can really change how we look at the world i think so i think that is kind of interesting aspect too awesome john if people want to learn more about you and just connect with yourself what's the best place for them to do that to do that sure um i would say best place to connect with me is on linkedin um i tend to be pretty active on that site um my name on linkedin is john patrick mullen j-o-h-n-p-a-t-r-i-c-k M U L L I N. Um, that's that's kind of the best way. I, I write for LinkedIn China, and I tend to be very active, writing posts, sharing videos, um, things of this nature. 
Um, so that's probably the best place. You can also check my website out, which is www.johnpatrickmullen.com. Awesome, guys. Until next time, we'll see you all in the next episode.